do you ever get that feeling when you reach some place totally new that somehow you've been there before? Hello, I'm starting an adventure with six grand in my pocket. I might choose a mini adventure, the Kawasaki Versys X300, because X means it's more dirt worthy than the other Versys, yet we still have a fairing for comfortable touring. Or I could put my six large into a more traditional dual sport. The traditional dual sport, a Honda CRF 250L. It's a dirt bike that's actually properly capable off road, and seeing as neither motorcycle has the balls for long highway use, perhaps I wouldn't miss the fairing after all. Well, I'd better take the mini adventure. See, Kawasaki isn't alone in their class, but they do own it. BMW's G310 GS is mostly a road bike. See inverted shocks, see mag wheels, see the G310R hidden underneath. Likewise, the CRF250 Rally is mostly a dirt bike, just a CRF250L playing dress up. The CSC RX3 is tailor-made for adventure, but will vibrate itself to pieces thanks to a buzzy single cylinder. In fact, the only mini-adventure besides my Kawasaki that isn't plagued by a thumper is the V-Strom 250, which we won't get in North America. So I made the right choice. Frame, bodywork, suspension, everything specially built for mini-adventure. Well, almost everything. The engine is a ninja. 296cc parallel twin ripped straight from Kawasaki's sport bike. It makes pitiful torque, but an impressive 39 horsepower. Do the math, and the Versys power to weight ratio is literally identical to the much larger KLR650. 168. With a slight tailwind, a light breakfast, and a route aligned with the Earth's geomagnetic pole, it'll do 168. So deja vu, the top speed is literally identical to the much larger KLR650. Put the Versys up against the little thumpers in the CRF250, G310, and RX3, and you won't even have a contest. Of course, that pot of power comes at the end of the rainbow. To feel 39 horses at once, you'd better dump the clutch at 11,500 RPM. Good thing my little pony enjoys the high life. With weightless 62mm pistons traveling an imperceptible 49mm stroke, now this bike can go hard all day without actually putting that much strain on its engine. In fact, the limiter is set more out of mercy than necessity. From where I'm sitting, 12,750 RPM doesn't feel anywhere close to the braking point. Much of that has to do with the utter and mysterious lack of vibration. Sure, there are weighted bar ends and foot pegs, sure, it's an internally counterbalanced twin, but still, for a sub 300cc rigid mounted engine to cruise at 130 km an hour and 9500 RPM with neither numbness in my hands nor fuzziness in my mirrors, it's incredible. Once you learn to ignore the frenzied tachometer and the sound of 200 explosions every second, there's no reason why you shouldn't hit MotoGP revs in the most inappropriate places. Oddly enough, Kawasaki spent in the engine without skimping on suspension. These KYB forks might be the wrong way up, but they're fattened down low to reduce flex. Plus the shocks are perfectly tuned, poised and planted on pavement, yet shockingly sure-footed, if a little stiff, off-road. I mean, sure, the critic in me wants to complain that only the rear is adjustable and only for preload, but honestly, if you want one setting to ride on and off-road, there's nothing to adjust. It's perfect. Put me on a track with the Versys X, and I'd lap within a second or two of the Ninja 300. It really is that good performance-wise. But what about the long haul? Well, the 17 liter tank is best in class. I've been getting over 400 kilometers between fill-ups, which destroys the little Beamer, the little CRF, and most of their older siblings. Whether you can sit for 400 kilometers on the hardest seat in the world is another question. But at least the cockpit is spacious. It starts with that sunken 32.1 inch seat. So even at six foot three, I'm well covered by the immovable windscreen. Then the fairing obviously feels the need to compensate for something because it looks like the front end of a 650. 
These plastics mainly enclose empty space, but at least the bike doesn't look dinky. And Kawasaki used some of the extra room to build an air duct, which deflects hot air coming off the radiator. The Versys is literally cool to ride. Even with a pillion on the back, even with the virgin mounting plate drilled and bolted to my luggage, neither us, nor the engine, nor the suspension are melting under the pressure. Speaking of pressure, it takes none to operate the clutch. One wonders if it's even attached to anything, especially since there seems to be no engagement point. Whoa, that was sudden. And finally, the dash is analog for the important stuff and digital for everything else. Team Green also picked out spots for a 12 volt outlet and an auxiliary light switch, but I wouldn't bother specking the former. Our little alternator only turns 21 amps at 5,000 RPM, so you won't be powering much more than a cell phone. It's an above average dash for the price, so long as your eyes are good enough to see the smaller than average symbols. But I guess this bike isn't meant for old folks anyway. So the Versys X is smooth, fast, and perfectly capable of touring across Canada. I suppose that's why we say Versys and not KLR 300. It's a street bike first, then dirt. A fact well evidenced by the power delivery. Kawasaki tuned the airbox shape, fuel injection, header length, and sprocket ratio to make more oomph in the bottom end, but it wasn't enough. You have to rev the shit out of this bike to brake traction. Even when I use the clutch to dump power, I can hardly steer with the rear wheel. Then there's the ABS problem. I didn't notice it on pavement because it takes a Herculean squeeze of the lever to engage the tiniest tickle of anti-lock. But on dirt, you can see the ABS in all its hideous glory. The rear sensor has an incessant sampling rate, so I can't trick it into locking up at all. I just roll right into whatever I'm trying to avoid. Front ABS has the opposite problem. It's too lenient, allowing me to readily lock up and wash out the front tire. If I could switch the two actuators, this might be one of the best ABS systems off-road. But as it is, it's probably the worst. So here I am, cramming 12,000 explosions into every minute. 12,000 explosions shredding the dirt, straining the choice I made, stretching the seams of time. Hello, I'm starting an adventure with six grand in my pocket, and I'd better take the dual sport. The CRF 250L was slow, sloppy, uncomfortable, and unrefined on pavement, but on the dirt it's heavy. What surprises me is how much I'm reminded of the Versys X. The wire wheels are similar, though the Versys wears 1719, while the CRF wears 1821. Weight is familiar too. Of course the Versys was heavier at 386 pounds, but with a tubed steel frame drilled through with lightning holes and using the engine as a stressed member, it got pretty close to this dual sport. In fact, when I'm up on the pegs, I forget where I am. Is this the serrated metal of a CRF at my feet, or the flat metal of a Versys X with the foot peg rubbers removed? Either bike would run circles around a large adventure or scrambler. Of course the CRF is far superior on the dirt, but mainly it just shows me how close Kawasaki came to being damn good as well. Imagine you're watching a movie, and it shows you everything that goes bad in the future. But the movie hasn't happened yet, so you can change it, right? Hello, I'm starting an adventure with six grand in my pocket, but I have some changes to make first. There's the ABS fuse. And we're going up two teeth on the rear for more low end grunt. Without ABS, the Versys decelerates just fine off road. And with a few extra teeth on the rear sprocket, it's easy enough to get the back tire breaking free. I can live with the Versys X like this. Anywhere, anytime.
but still no skid plate available. Now I could reroute the headers to gain like another four inches, or I just have to weld something to cover them up. Now either way, the 7.1 inches I have of ground clearance, it's probably not enough anymore. The front fender is wearing away from rocks and mud and stuff. I probably should have raised it last year. Flat. Now I'm gonna have to patch a tube. I didn't get the center stand though, so I'm gonna have to jack it up on the uh, on the swing arm, I guess. Just have to be careful not to drop it because the mirrors stick out so far. The Versys X got me here to this place where I've built adventure skills, where I can push a 550 pound, 150 horsepower motorcycle off road. And it was a good way to learn. But if you go back five years, didn't we already have a perfect way to learn? A way that was easier? A way that was more bulletproof? A way that was more focused? A way that was more fun. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend the Versys X to new adventurers. It epitomizes a new genre, but the best introduction to ADV riding is an old one. The dual sport. It's how all of us got here and it's still the best way to learn. best starter bike. It's about looking forward to myself in 50 years having already lived on the narrow seats of dual sports and picked up ADV bikes that grow heavier with age. When I get old, what will I want then? <laughs> 